Hi there, everyone. Start over again. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about night driving and talking to you about the celebration we had last night with my family and I and some friends over. We were celebrating the Parallel Park video and the 1 million views that that got last Monday. So Sat Ann is here. Rinwer is here. Easton is here. Pablo is here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pablo, for the like. And for, for those of you who are joining us on the replay, be sure to hit that like. And as well, if you're new to Smart Drive Test, Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license, veteran drivers to remain crash free, and CDL drivers to start a career as a bus or truck driver. So be sure to hit that subscribe button if you're new here. And welcome to Smart Drive Test, where we have some new branding. We have new channel art for the Smart Drive Test channel. As well, we have a new opening. So Rinward is ready to get going today. Hall phase, my day was really good, really good. I got a video up this morning for the first time in a few weeks. Rose is here, uh, Rinward, Brock, lots of people here, Sebastian. And as well, if you want questions answered, by all means, uh, there's also Super Chat available and always open to taking bribes. So yes, thank you so much, Sebastian, that's really great. So what's the good news today? Oh, Hall Phase, the good news today is, is that last Monday, the Parallel Park video hit uh, 1 million views. So it was the first video to go over 1 million. So that's really great. And thanks for that, Corey. Bricks for Wheels is Corey. That's Corey. Corey is the moderator. And Tommy's here and all the people are here. So it's really great. So lots going on. And we're also, as I said, we're talking about night driving tonight i'm just going to go over that again i know i did that a few weeks ago but i just with summer coming on i think it's important for people to go over that so video and audio is good thanks for that corey uh liz is here from the philippines that's awesome uh what time is it in the philippines liz rinward okay the light is green for car a and car c do i need to get some paper for this <laughs> car a wants to turn left car b wants to turn right where the lights are green for car b Okay, so left, right, they both are allowed to turn, but since they're going the same direction, there is a risk of collision. So who gets to go? Okay, Rinward, when the cars are turning, one's turning right, one's turning left, uh, are they turning onto a multi-lane? Are they turning onto a signal, a single lane? And I'll tell you the rules for right of way. Uh, right of way is straight through has the right of way over turning vehicles and right turning vehicles have the right of way over left turning vehicles and left the, unless the left turning vehicle has already committed to the turn. I mean, it already started to do it. So yes, thank you very much Hall Phase. That's really awesome, 1 million. And actually uh, it shouldn't be too long here, probably another couple of months and how to shift the non synchromesh transmission video will also roll over a million. So there's two videos there that are gonna get uh, pretty good there. Uh, yep, haul phase, it certainly is the hardest thing to do for new drivers preparing to pass a road test is the parallel parking. And um, uh, however, once you master parallel parking, it's going to improve your overall driving. Okay, Carvel. Uh, and haul phase, I'm talking about night driving today. I got a video, a presentation for you on that. So, Carvel. Uh, No, Rinwer, I understand that what you're asking me about the left and right turning vehicles is at an intersection, but the question I'm asking you is at a complex intersection where they're turning onto a multi-lane road. Again, right turning has right of way over left turning, but if it's onto a multi-lane road where they're turning onto two lanes, they can go at the same time, but what it's recommended is that they not turn in beside each other when you turn in the spaces between the vehicles. That's the safety feature. Okay, Carvel, what you need to do, there you go. Yes, some good videos there that Corey has put up. I need more practice on balancing merging lanes. Okay, so Carvel, there is a, a playlist on how to change lanes and how to merge properly, and that'll help you time uh, help you to do that. So what time is it on the West Coast? Hall phase it is 6 p.m. on the East Coast, Pacific time. And it is 9 o'clock in the morning in the Philippines. Thank you so much, Liz, for that. So we're going to get going here pretty quick. Um, Easton, uh, after watching a lot of your videos and talking to the boss, I'm a stagehand. I was finally convinced to start on my journey to my CDL. That is awesome, Easton. And anything that we can help you do that with, that would be really great. And Liz, good morning to you. 
and Tommy's here and Sad Ann is also here. So thanks very much for being here. Sad Ann is in Russia and he is on the map of success. And if you haven't seen the map of success, I don't know why this took me so long to start doing this, but all the drivers uh, that have passed their road test are put onto a Google Maps and you can see where in the world uh, that people have passed the road test. So Brock is in Kansas, uh, uh, the state of Kansas, I suspect, uh, and it's eight o'clock there in Kansas. Uh, Rinwer, yes, it's a multi two lane. Like I said, they shouldn't go in the same direction, but from what you were seeing, it seems like the left turning vehicle should yield to the right turning car. Yes, but again, Rinwer, we come back to that saying again, you can be right or you can be dead right. So if one car is going, the other car needs to give the right of get, yield to that vehicle so that there isn't a conflict in space and eventually it results in a crash, okay? So essentially, if, if the left turning vehicle is gonna go, even though the right turning vehicle has the right of way, the right turning vehicle should yield to that other car to prevent a collision. Okay, Sorry is scared of driving. So what you need to do, Sorry, is I would recommend that you look at the video on uh, fear and anxiety. So overcoming fear and anxiety for driving. There's lots of really good skills there uh, that will help you to get over your anxiety for driving. Okay. Where would you be driving? Tommy, um, I must have missed something also I need to know in regards to the road test. Okay, we'll go over that. There we go, okay. All right, Carvel. So what I recommend to you, Carvel, to pass your road test, everything that you need is here on the YouTube channel to pass your road test. So what I, I recommend to you is watch the videos here on the YouTube channel, the Smart Drive Test YouTube channel. Look at those and then when you think you're getting ready and you're confident that you're gonna be able to pass your road test, Hire a driving school for one hour or do a practice driving test. They'll be able to give you the information about your skills and abilities, where, at what level they're at, and whether you're ready to take a road test. And that is the most inexpensive way to practice and do your road test, is to watch the videos here and then hire a driving school to do a practice driving test. And in some US states, I know Sam, uh, at Rookie Auto Driving School in the Bronx in New York. They only charge $20 for a practice driving test, so it's really good money, okay? So, uh, and that's really great. Uh, do you know if your driving records have to be clean to get a CDL? No, it does not have to be clean hall phase to get a CDL license. It, it certainly helps, but if you have a couple of speeding tickets on your uh, driver's abstract, that's not gonna prevent you from getting a job after you get your license. Okay, Easton, is there a video for the basis of a class A CDL permit test? Uh, not per se, Easton, but one of the chapters, uh, okay, CDL permit test, Easton, tell me first where you are in the United States, okay, and then I'll be able to go from there. There we go, Sad Ann uh, has requested, Corey, that if you can put up the, the link to the map of success. Do you do you have that or do, or do I need to get that for you, Corey? Okay. Okay. Par... New York City. I just got uh, TLNC. Now I'm driving a taxi cab, but I f feel fear while I'm driving because traffic. Give me tips on how to overcome fear. Okay. So, uh, part up. Have a look at the video on fear and anxiety that Corey's put up here. So Easton is in the great state of Missouri. That's awesome. Mark is here. Are you? I'm a qualified instructor in the UK for trucks and coaches. Now I live in London, Ontario, looking to take my instructors in Canada. Yes, Mark. Awesome. Welcome to Canada. Welcome to London, Ontario. Mark, <laughs> I lived in London, Ontario for a lot of years, uh, most of the 1990s. And I got my first instructor's license in Ontario at the Ontario Safety League in Toronto. So that's where you might have to go, Mark, to get your license, to get your instructor's license there in, uh, in Ontario. Now, if you've been a qualified instructor prior, Mark, uh, you might just have to do some upgrading. And what I would suggest is, is to start with the Ontario Safety League there in Ontario and they'll be able to give you the best uh, course of action to get your driving instructor's license back. And I can tell you right now that 
uh, Ontario Truck Driving School is there in London and I've worked for them as well so okay uh, do wop have a look at the video Corey I'll put that up for you uh, for making turns on red lights right turns on red lights okay there we go there you go so Corey's got that excellent thank you so much Corey tips on shifting uh, bodacious tips on shifting are you talking about shifting a manual transmission for a passenger vehicle is that what you're talking about or are you talking about a non synchromesh transmission Nicholas do you have any tips on driving on interstates and at higher speeds yes uh, Nicholas if you're not comfortable driving on interstates and freeways definitely stay in the right hand lane and keep a better uh, space management so for example instead of two to three seconds have a four to five second and that will give you better uh, reaction time while you're driving on the interstate and give better space around your vehicle okay chase I was wondering what to do if an emergency vehicle that is responding to an emergency is in your lane and right behind you no way move into a different lane prior to them approaching behind you uh, Okay, um, Chase, there's always some place that you can get out of the path of the emergency vehicle for the purposes of a road test. On a road test, you have to come to a stop. If you don't come to a stop in a road test for an emergency vehicle, that's an automatic fail on a road test. So if they just kind of uh, show up, if they just kind of sneak up on you, uh, you kind of have to have your wits about you and you have to try and apply and find a place whether you can turn in at, at an intersection or something like that but you need to figure out some way to get out of the way of that okay do up uh, Corey is the moderator bricks for wheels that's Corey sorry about that I'll just ask me to repeat stuff and I'll do that for you okay uh, JFSA 380 thanks very much for showing up tonight good evening on road trucks and trailers is there a benefit to having your fifth wheel and tandems forward or rearward uh, weight notwithstanding uh, um, okay I'm getting <laughs> we are busy tonight lots of questions JFSA 380 okay usually for the the fifth wheel because you can slide the fifth wheel on the back of the tractor so JFSA 380 you generally want the fifth wheel in the center of where it can slide and the reason for that is for weight distribution and handling of the vehicle uh, and generally you don't move the fifth wheel it's very it's not it's uncommon to move the fifth wheel the only reason that you're going to move the fifth wheel is because you got a short trailer and the dollies are farther forward and you have to move the fifth wheel back so that your dollies aren't running into the back of your tractor now uh, if you're running 53s you got to be at the 41 foot mark for uh, bridge law and I don't know how much you know about J uh, bridge law JFSA 380 but you got to have tandems at 41 feet because there's a certain amount of weight per distribution on bridges uh, it, most of the dry vans you're going to be pulling are going to be 53 footers and so you got to have this trailer tandems but you're going to sometimes you're going to have to move the trailer tandems uh, owing to uh, weight distribution so that you're within weight regulations of how much weight you're allowed on your trailer uh, bah, 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 bah. so what else do I need to say about that one of the things that I used to do when I used to run 48 foot trailers because we were still running a few 48 foot trailers I liked the tandems back farther it was easier to back up uh, there's a few other reasons but it's kind of a personal preference about where you have them most of the time where you're gonna situate the fifth wheel on the back of the tractor and where you're gonna spin put the, the trailer bogies uh, is going to depend on your weight distribution on your tractor okay so there's Corey Hall phase 40 people <laughs> yes Hall phase there we go you're keeping count tonight so does uh, is that more or less answer your question okay so JFSA Johnny C can you go over staying centered within a lane please yes there's a video on that have you seen that video Johnny okay Liam yes there we go okay uh, Lars how many seconds do you need to stay behind a large vehicle in the city uh, Lars under ideal conditions you're gonna stay two to three seconds behind other traffic however when you're talking about larger vehicles oftentimes because they're so big you can't see around the vehicle so what's gonna happen is you're gonna stay back farther 
so that you can see around that vehicle and have better uh, reaction time and whatnot. So oftentimes you're going to move out maybe to four seconds so you can see around them and whatnot. Hall phase, can you tell us the best way to cross a street with no crosswalk? Yes, uh, hall phase, uh, just make sure that you have eye contact with the drivers and make sure you have enough space because you're going to need uh, 8 to 12 seconds to cross four lanes of traffic. So know that. So you're going to need at least half a block to one block between you and any vehicles on the roadway. Okay, bricks for wheels, bricks for wheels. Aloha, Rick, blessed one. Now, blessed one, you passed your road test today. Am I correct on that? I think I am, and I can see all the flowers here, and that is really awesome. Or it was a short time ago, I know that. Uh, <laughs> Rinwer. Uh, if both vehicles are turning left, there's always room because by the time you get to the center of the intersection with two vehicles turning left, what's happening is the two vehicles are moving away from each other. So it's it's rare that you're not going to have enough space in the intersection for two vehicles to turn left at the same time. Okay, Edgar, can you give some tips on maintaining speed on highways? Uh, Mark, that's awesome. Thanks so much for your subscription. Welcome to Smart Drive Test. All the best there. And if you have any requests or need any help at all, Mark, I'm more than happy to, to give you a hand there to get you going here again in Canada with your driving instructor's license for sure. Edgar, maintaining speeds on highways. Uh, Edgar, what I recommend is using cruise control. And Corey will dig that video up for you on how to use cruise control. Uh, sorry, what kinds of vehicles do I recommend for new drivers? The vehicles I recommend for new drivers, sorry, are Toyota Corollas, Honda Civics, uh, to uh, Honda CRVs, uh, Toyota RAV4s. Uh, I'm I'm very biased when it comes to vehicles, and I really like the Toyota RAV4s, the Corollas, the Civics. Uh, those kind of those are the vehicles that I recommend for for new drivers to drive. They're reliable vehicles. They're easy to handle. They're not very big, and and you can move them around and those types of things. JFSA 380, yes sir, as usual, very helpful. I forgot to say good evening as well. <laughs> That's okay. Our company trucks run doubles and 53s, very light, but always have the drivers who insist their axles need to be all the way back or the all the way up. Yeah, JFSA 380, that's, um, you know, it's just what it is. Now, the other thing, 380, is do you have policies? Some companies have policies that when you back the trailer into the dock, the 53 footers, you have to slide the tandems all the way back just for that balance when the fork truck goes in that the trailer doesn't tip up because you get some of those older shorter trailers and that's what happens are they are they is that what they're saying uh yeah and you know like i said it's what you said some drivers want them all the way up some drivers want them all the way back it's just it's just a personal preference uh personally i like the trailer tandems farther back you get a better ride and i can see where they are and it's a lot easier to back up Yes, hall phase. I'm going to start the presentation here. I just got lots of stuff going on here. Okay, tips on how to merge on the freeway. Do what? There's a whole playlist on that, and Corey will get that up for you. Uh, Lars, yes, they are all Japanese cars. <laughs> Lars, what is your recommendation for cars for new drivers? Because I'm certainly open to suggestions. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to go over to the presentation and then I'll come back and I'll answer more questions. Okay, so everybody hang on here. Just bear with me for one sec while I make the transition over. Well, that's not what I wanted at all. And of course, it's not doing what I want it to do. All right, here we go, that. And I can't answer questions uh, during the presentation because I've only got two screens on and I can't have uh, the, the live stream open here and see the questions. Yes, we're working on another screen. <laughs> so maybe we can do that uh, when I get the sponsor button on my YouTube channel. We can take up a collection for another screen and then I can answer questions during the presentation. But what we're, what we're going to talk about tonight is night driving. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rick August. I do have a PhD. My PhD is in legal history. For those of you who may or may not know, legal history is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing, 
specifically as it relates to traffic. So I know a lot of the legal matters about policing and uh, you can still see me because I haven't made the transition. So there you go. So there's the presentation night driving. Uh, I drove truck through Canada and the United States for most of the 1990s. I went back to university, uh, pursued a PhD, and uh, prior to starting my PhD at the University of Melbourne in Australia, I drove coaches for Greyhound for a year and part-time while I was at university, and that was a learning experience as well. So I have a lot of experience in uh, both trucks and buses. So most area, and just about any vehicle on the roadway, I've had some experience with it in teaching. And so today I got a video up for you, uh, left turns in large vehicles, it was just a tractor. So a class three vehicle, uh, uh, class D in Ontario and other places is what it's called. So turning in large vehicles and just talked about that. So if you've got multi-lane uh, turning lanes, you always wanna be in the left-hand lane and you wanna try, try and take as much space as you can. Uh, and remember that when you're turning with large vehicles and this will apply to buses, trucks and RV units as well, you wanna be in the outside lane and you want to stay to the right as much as possible to get the unit around and that way the off tracking is not going to cause your vehicle to drift in the other lane so if you haven't seen that do have a look at that uh, as well there's a new introduction we've uh, I've been working with a videographer and has made a new introduction so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about the new introduction for smart drive test so for some people driving at night is intimidating absolutely and I had a smart driver uh, say to me some months ago that driving at night is like driving on another planet and it very much is because at night our ability to see is reduced by half so we only have half the ability to see at night and some years ago I had a revelation when I was driving with truck drivers at night that they had difficulty locating where the road was so what I started to focus on was how to locate where the road is going and how to find landmarks along the roadway that would allow you to follow the roadway because one of the things you need to know about night driving is that the farther you get away from urban centers in other words the farther you get away from cities the more reliance you have on your headlights to see the roadway and to see where the roadway is going and what else is on the roadway so we're going to go over some of the skills and techniques that you can implement tonight to be able to find the roadway at night so there is a video on night driving that I did where I took uh, the cameras and put them in the car and showed you and identified uh, silhouettes where the curve of the road is and fewer lights since you want to slow down and those types of things because as I said, the farther you get away from cities, the more reliance on your headlights that you're going to need. In cities, there's lots of ambient light because of street lights and lights from buildings and those types of things so it's fairly easy to find the roadway in town but once you get out of town, it's considerably more challenging especially for newer drivers. Now, the first thing and the most important thing is, is if you are driving at night, think about your fatigue. How tired are you? Is it two o'clock in the morning? Is it three o'clock in the morning or five, four o'clock in the morning? How much sleep have you gotten? And this is especially important for commercial drivers. You need to manage your fatigue because you're gonna be tired and as well, pay attention to your circadian rhythm. That's essentially the biological clock that we all have in our bodies and our bodies are predisposed to feeling sleepy and groggy in the early afternoon, sort of between one and five in the afternoon, as well as one and five in the morning. So those are the two times a day, a day that you're gonna be predisposed to feeling like you have to fall asleep. So be aware of that. If you do feel tired, know that you need to get off the road, you need to get some sleep somewhere because that's the only thing that's gonna fix it. If it's the middle of the afternoon, it's a sunny day and you're driving along, Lots of people, lots of drivers have single vehicle collisions, which means that they just drive off the roadway or something like that because they fell asleep behind the wheel. So get someplace and get off the roadway and have a nap and do what you need to do to get a little bit of sleep. For truck drivers who have uh, road tractors that have sleeping quarters on them, just pull over in a rest area or someplace like that where you can get some sleep and whatnot. And as well, there are techniques for staying awake and combating fatigue while you're driving because I know for some commercial drivers, it's not an option to get off the road and stop. Uh, I used to have a 10 pound bag of carrots down beside the seat and I used to eat carrots and that would help me to keep awake. The other thing that'll help you stay awake is talking to other people. So if you have a hands-free cell phone or you have a CB radio in your vehicle, you can use those as well to stay awake and combat fatigue. Now, the other thing you need to know about night driving, and I've talked about this in other videos, is that sunset and sunrise are the most dangerous times of the day to drive because 
our eyes are adjusted to the bright sky however we're driving in the dark landscape and other road users cyclists pedestrians people on scooters motorcyclists and those types of smaller vulnerable road users can hide in the dark landscape and we won't see them because our eyes are adjusted to the bright landscape and the other aspect of this is oftentimes at sunset you'll get the sun right on the horizon and you'll be driving into glaring sun which even makes it even harder to drive during these times because of the disparate light conditions all right so when you're driving at night one of the first things that i recommend is try and turn down your dash lights as much as possible to the lowest level that you can tolerate them and if you're driving in interstates and freeways the other thing you can do at night is just turn your dash lights to the almost off position and just set the cruise and put the the vehicle on cruise control at a specific speed because if you're on freeways and multi-lane highways and those types of things you're not going to have a whole lot of uh, traffic situations that are going to cause you to slow down so what so that's what i suggest use cruise control and set your dash lights to the lowest possible limit that you can tolerate and be able to drive the vehicle because that's going to reduce fatigue because our eyes are attracted to light and movement particularly light and because you have that bright dash light down below where you're looking out the windscreen it's going to cause fatigue and cause your eyes to be drawn down instead of out on the roadway and as well that bright dash light is going to erode your night vision because we all have night vision our eyes will adjust to the low light conditions our pupils will get bigger and we'll be able to take in more light but unfortunately if we have these bright dash lights operating in our vehicle it's going to undermine that night vision that we're going to develop after 20 minutes or a half an hour driving at night so again turn down your dash lights as i said in the introduction of the presentation the farther you get away from cities the more reliance you have on your headlights Whenever possible, use your high beams as much as possible, but know that if you're tired in combination with driving at night, oftentimes you're gonna to forget to turn your high beams down, and that can really annoy other drivers and cause a lot of fatigue and stress for other drivers. Now, if you do uh, ha are on a two-lane road and other vehicles are forgetting to turn their lights down or you're finding them really bright, just look to the outside of the lane and look at the fog line and that way it's going to help to protect your night vision while you're driving at night. Now looking for the roadway, the number one uh, landmark that's going to help you to find and identify the roadway and where it's going at night so that you can follow it accurately is looking for other traffic because for the most part other traffic, at least we hope, is going to be driving on the roadway. So follow other traffic, uh, look for street lights, look for reflectors. Uh, especially along highways and interstates they're going to have reflectors on the concrete barriers on either side of the roadway uh, look down the road for houses along the roadway because most houses and uh, farmyards and those types of things are all going to have lights on the front of the house and those types of things and that's going to help you to locate the roadway and where the roadway is going uh, and its direction and whether it's going to change direction as you're driving at night uh, one of the other things that's going to help you to locate the roadway at night, and you can see this, this is a really excellent picture, is to look for the silhouette of the trees. You can see here that the roadway is pretty much going straight, and this will also indicate to you if the road curves either to the left or right, because if you look up through the tops of the trees, you can see the skyline uh, where the roadway has been cut through the trees. And as well at night, if you get into a some area where there's very reduced light and it's very dark you're going to obviously want to be able to slow down as well so that you can find the roadway and be safe and not overdrive your headlights overdriving your headlights simply means that you're not going to get stopped in the distance that your headlights shine and you're going to strike an animal or another vehicle or something else on the roadway now as i said uh when I recommended that you turn down your dash lights to protect and maintain your night vision is to use cruise control. And if you haven't seen this video already on cruise control, I highly, highly recommend cruise control anytime that you're driving on highways for a distance because cruise control can reduce distracted driving because you're not monitoring your speed uh, all the time. And therefore you can focus on driving and actually focus on looking out the, the windscreen and focusing on what's happening with the changing traffic patterns and the changing road conditions. So turn down your dash lights as much as possible. If you're on a highway or a freeway or a motorway or whatnot, use, put your vehicle on cruise control. 
and then stay in the right hand lane and if you're passing just leave it on cruise control and just drive out into the other lane and then pass the other vehicle and move back into the right lane and you're not going to have to do a lot of passing if you're on cruise control and oftentimes what i say to students is is that set your cruise control five to eight kilometers an hour or five miles an hour less than what the traffic flow is and you're going to be traveling a little bit less than the traffic flow and if you have that on cruise control, what's going to happen is, is that you're going to end up driving in the spaces between the clusters of vehicles because all the other vehicles will just pass you and you won't have to do a whole lot of passing if you're just slightly below uh, the traffic flow on the highway or freeway or wherever you might be. All right, so those are some tips and techniques and we can talk a little bit about that in the questions and answers about driving at night and uh, how to find the roadway and reliance on your headlights and maintaining your night vision and as well most importantly managing your fatigue and knowing that you're going to be tired you're specifically uh, early afternoon and the wee hours of the morning that you're going to be more tired than other times of the day and that you're susceptible to falling asleep at the wheel and if you fall asleep at the wheel there's a good possibility that you could have a single vehicle crash and there are lots and lots there's a very high percentage of crashes that occur uh, and there's no explanation of what happened and in many cases either the driver was intoxicated or inebriated some way or this driver simply fell asleep at the wheel and drove off the roadway and that happens more than we would like to think so keep all of that in mind uh, when you're driving at night and specifically in the summertime and if you are drinking those types of things I strongly recommend that you don't find a way to sleep over sleep in your car do whatever you need to do to get yourself home safe and that you're not driving when you've been drinking or you know doing drugs or those kinds of things okay so yes so we're just gonna slide back over here and answer answer some more questions all right so there we go and get back over here to this and there we go okay all right so we'll see what we got back here do up thank you so much for that following the tips okay tommy i currently drive a 2016 ford focus titanium nice size and it's very easy to handle there you go yes and a ford focus would be a good starter car uh it's small it's easy to handle as tommy says so yes that would work for you too edgar you deserve so much more subscribers you were going to have <laughs> thank you so much edgar that is flattering yes and i'm that's that's the hope and goal is to really help as many people as we can uh 380 not much so much policy but i never had a problem with the tandems at about two-thirds back fifth wheel centered our customers sort out the trailers as they see fit oh, okay awesome so that seems to work out really well for you then yeah i had a few you know i really <laughs> Uh, 380 I, I really dislike sliding the trailer tandems especially if I was trying to get the weight distribution right because uh, I drove most of the stuff in the States and it was 12,000 on the steers 36,000 pounds on the tandems and then trying to get that trailer one it was always the trailer one you had to slide and you know mine was back in the days when you had to pull the pin to unlock the pins on the on the trailer bogies but now they have the new trailers and they have air pistons on the pins and you just go back and pull the valve and it's really awesome to just slide the trailer tandems it's much easier than the, than in my day so um yeah so i used to just uh i used to on the 48s i liked them at the back the 53 you always wanted them around the 41 foot mark to keep in you know so you didn't get breach that bridge law okay sebastian i have a brother who hasn't drove a car in two and a half years and wants to get back on the road what should he do sebastian he should look at the video on how to learn how to drive Corey will put that up for you and go to the parking lot get some of those 36 inch one meter tall pylons and just do the exercises there get yourself a stretch of two by four and then try and you know back up over the two by four with both sides of the vehicle and th those exercises will really get you know back into controlling the mat uh, the primary controls in the vehicle and how to turn and how it responds and all those types of things so that'll really help out and Corey will get that video up for you all right uh blessed yes i had my license for a long time ago just afraid to drive just trying to learn the controls in the car like for instance wipers lights all uh just subscribe and enjoy watching your video thank you so much for that and as well for the secondary controls on the vehicle uh blessed Corey will get that up for you 
uh, and have a look at that and that will give you some more explanation about the secondary controls in the vehicle as opposed to the primary controls. And the primary controls are the steering wheel, the throttle and the brake. Those are the primary controls. And then the secondary controls goes over most of the other stuff in the vehicle. There might be a few things that are different in your vehicle, but for the most part, those will help you out. Uh, in the UK, we use MSM PSL when you want to make a turn or overtake. Use mirror signal, maneuver, position, speed, look. Yes. So that's another variation mark on what you're talking about there is um, that's the whole package for making a turn in a vehicle and how to explain it to a student. The mirror signal shoulder check that I'm talking about is just the observation component of how to make a turn. And uh, probably the videos, there's two videos marked that you can have a look at on how to make left turns and how to make right turns. And those uh, is essentially what you're saying. It's just slightly different in terms of um, how we do it here, uh, or at least how I do it. And how I do it is not the only way to do it. And you'll find that out that there are a lot of different driving instructors that do uh, you know how to teach that stuff to students in different ways but essentially you've got the same thing in what you're talking about here okay okay da -da 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 -da. Brock can you get your CDL if you have a failure to control a motor vehicle uh, four years ago Easton uh, in Kansas yeah as yeah Brock as Easton said the, the challenge you're gonna have is finding an employer but that doesn't say that you're not going to be able to. If you, the, the challenge with CDL, with getting a CDL, is, is getting experience. If you can get your CDL license and you can get six months experience, once you get six months experience, you're set to go. And, but essentially what I say to drivers, new drivers, is beg, borrow, and steal a truck. Do whatever you can do to get that experience to be able to drive the truck. Sebastian, what is your advice for a former driver who wants to get back on the road despite not driving for two and a half years? Yeah, I went over that, Sebastian. Uh, is it easier to drive in the day with heavy traffic or at night with minimum traffic? Uh, hall phase, both of those conditions have their challenges. Uh, heavy traffic, it's just you're just not going to make the time that you would in less dense traffic conditions, so know that. So one of the reasons I used to drive truck at night because there wasn't as much traffic on the roadway, however you're combating fatigue and you're trying to stay awake at night so you have to put in skills and abilities and get plenty of sleep so that you can drive at night but know as well uh you know dash lights and other lights on the roadway and all of those those sorts of things are going to cause fatigue and eventually you're going to get tired what i suggest to drivers particularly cdl drivers who are driving at night for a living is try to sleep between one or two in the morning and six to eight in the morning. Try and sleep during that period of time because your body is very much predisposed to going to sleep at that time. If you can get five hours of sleep during the wee hours of the morning, you're gonna be a lot better off than trying to push it all the way through uh, all night. But if you can, you know, two or three hours or four hours at night, then that's really gonna make it a lot easier for you to carry on with your job and do your job every day, okay? Um, Yeah, Easton, you're, yeah, that's good. If you can get trained by your employer, that certainly gives you a leg up for sure. Uh, Brock, what I suggest uh, to students, you know, whether they're going for a CDL license uh, or whether they're just going for their regular license, just on, go on Google there and see what the reviews are for these different driving schools. Those reviews are quite accurate in terms of the information they give and, and look at the comments and the feedback that they give you. And that will give you a good indication of which driving school you want to go to and what kind of training you're going to receive from those different kinds of driving schools. Now, one thing I will say to you about driving schools, uh, the one question that you want to ask a driving school, regardless of whether you're going for your car license or whether you're going for a truck or bus license, do I have the same instructor for the duration of my course? If they do not give you, if they move you around between different instructors, go to a different school. I completely disagree with students being put with whoever whichever driving instructor is available because it's just too hard for the student and it's too hard for the instructors and it causes a lot of angst and 
bad relationships between the student and the school. You want to start with one instructor and you want to be with that one instructor for the duration of your course. So that's one thing that I do say, okay? All right, uh, Liam, should I dip my headlights when I crest a hill? I'm always worried an opposing driver is going to come over uh, and I'll blind them. Uh, Liam, that's not, not too bad. I mean, you can sort of look over the crest of the hill and you can see whether another vehicle is coming or not. That is a good practice. If you're coming up the top of the hill, just dim your lights. And then when you come over and there aren't any vehicles there, just turn back to the high beam again. Okay. There you go. Easton helping out. Thank you so much. Adam. Hi, Rick. Adam, how are you? I just read my license today. I'm thinking of purchasing a car. Any recommendations for new drivers purchasing car insurance to help them lower the, ex the extravagant, extravagant costs? Yeah, Adam, where, just remind me again, where are you in the world? And I might be able to give you a little bit more um, information about that. Okay. About your experience, do what? what, what I'm sorry, what was the question you wanted me to answer about experience? Alan. Yeah, thanks so much, Alan, for that confirmation. Yes, that's absolutely true. If you get your CDL license and you get six months experience uh, driving a, a rig, you can pretty much write your own ticket after that. You're not going to have troubles getting a job and getting a really good job and, and working where you want to work and drive the equipment that you want to work. Now, one of the other things about getting a CDL job is if you're a bit fit and you want to actually guarantee that you get yourself a job, one of the things you might want to consider is uh, running flat deck. Uh, a lot of guys don't want to do flat deck work because it's a fair bit of work in terms of uh, strapping down loads and tarping and those types of things. So that might be something you want to consider as well. Uh, flat deck work tends to pay a little bit more money because of the extra work that you have to do uh, in terms of uh, strapping down loads and putting tarps on and those types of things. So do wop how unsafe is smoking weed before driving well it's probably really unsafe because you're inebriated while you're driving and you're not at your best <laughs> abilities uh and you're essentially inebriated so i don't recommend doing it i unfortunately i know that there are a lot of people who do i'm not naive when it comes to knowing that drivers drink and do drugs while they're driving there are a lot of people who are there's people who are distracted and this is one of the things that i tell people is that other drivers on the roadway you have no idea what condition those people are in whether they're upset they're emotionally upset they've been drinking they've been uh doing drugs uh, they're yelling at their kids, they're talking on their phone, they're distracted in some way. So there are lots of people who are doing uh, those types of things. So it's unsafe to do to smoke weed before you drive your vehicle. And I don't recommend it. But do know that there are other drivers on the roadway who are not going to be at their top condition for driving a vehicle. And this is one of the reasons why I advocate that you stay away from other vehicles. Manage space around your vehicles. So driving lessons by BMS, that's Big Mac Sam. Big Mac Sam is a driving instructor in the Bronx. He works for Rookie Auto Driving School there. And Sam is really great at helping other people get their license and is really awesome. And Alan loves flat deck, flat deck work because of the exercise. Yeah, I did have a short stint uh, with flat deck work at the end of my driving career there. And I, I totally enjoyed it too because of the extra work. Easton, so right off the bat, there are two Kansas schools that stand out first is White Line. I have heard good things about this school from drivers at work. Second, second is Kansas Commercial uh, Driving School. So there's two driving schools there and, and Easton. Uh, did you get the uh, recommendations, Easton? Did you get those off Google reviews there? Just leave me that there. Adam, so you're, okay, so you're in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, Adam, um, so if you're in Boston, Can you take a defensive driving course? Will that help to reduce your cost of insurance when you start driving? Is I think that's something that you can do in the States. It's not so much here in Canada that you can get a reduction on your insurance if you take a defensive driving course, but I'm almost positive that you can in the States. <coughs> 380, always wondered why they sell beer at the truck stops. 
380, I think they sell beer because there's a lot of truck drivers who actually finish their shift, right? So I would come in and I would stay at the truck stop for the night and I would have a beer and then go back up to my truck and go to sleep. That would be something I would do. However, I do, I under, totally understand your point about selling beer at truck stops, uh, you know, because it's pretty easy to, you know, go buy a beer, go out to your truck for an hour, have a beer, and then get behind the, the wheel and start driving, okay? Okay, Brock, uh, what I suggest to you, Brock, is whatever job you can get. When you first start driving, don't be picky. Uh, if you feel that you can do the work to do flat deck work, then do flat deck work. Flat deck work is going to pay a little bit more as well. It's going to be easier for you to get a job. So don't be picky in whatever you can do. Okay, uh, Easton, if you smoke weed before you drive, it puts you at serious risk, considered worse than alcohol in the States. And yes, I would agree with that, Easton. I have heard of white line uh, through drivers at work and have gone to that school. I also checked Google reviews. Austin, Easton, I did not know White Line was in Kansas. I always thought it was in Missouri because of how they talked about it. Doo-wop, you are most welcome. Anything else we can help you with, by all means, uh, drop us a note. So, uh, yeah, um, so like I said, we've been doing a bit of work here on the YouTube channel in terms of rebranding re a few things. We got some new channel art up on the YouTube channel as I mentioned previously as well we have a new intro for the videos and it's on the latest video and just leave me a comment I'd be really happy to hear your thoughts about it. I've got some good feedback from people so far I really liked it and uh, I'll just give a shout out for Fiverr uh, I went on Fiverr and I hired a videographer and I was very impressed with the work that they do and it was a reasonable cost I think it was less than a couple hundred dollars to get the intro done so I'm really impressed with the work that I've done I've had done on Fiverr and as well I got a graphic designer to do the work for the YouTube channel so it's a great place if you want to get some writing or graphic design or videography or whatever kind of work that you need to do there you go Easton Okay, haul phase, great question. Why don't truck drivers sleep in hotels? Some truck drivers do haul phase, uh, mostly uh, car haulers, uh, truck drivers that move cars because they're, most of them are day cabs. A lot of truck drivers sleep in their trucks because they're road tractors and they have bunks on them. So they have beds in them and some of them have refrigerators and closets and those types of things. And there are a number of truck drivers who actually live in their trucks. Uh, hotels tend to get very expensive. Uh, most inexpensive hotels now are even $60, $70 a night. So if you're staying in a hotel, you know, three or four nights a, a week, that really adds up in terms of, uh, in terms of cost. So this is the reason that a lot of truck drivers don't stay in hotels is, be, is simply because of the cost. And as well, it's, there aren't a great number of hotels that have parking lots big enough to put trucks into. Uh, some truck stops will have hotels attached to the truck stop, but tends not to be it, it tend that those tend to be few and far between. There aren't a great deal of those, so that's the reason why most truck drivers don't stay in hotels. Uh, the other tr types of truck drivers that do stay in hotels are uh, furniture haulers, uh, people that move houses and those types of things. Okay, uh, hall phase, show us the new intro, please. Okay, let me see if I can get it up for you. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you so much, Sam. I'm glad you like it. Uh, I was under the impression that a defensive driving course is used to help retrain bad drivers who get their license suspended. Yes, Adam, that is one of the reasons for defensive driving courses in the States. But I also think that you can take a defensive driving course and you can submit that certificate when you apply for your insurance. And your insurance, because you've taken a defensive driving course, will reduce, uh, the um will give you a discount on your insurance so that's the other way you can do that okay let me see if i can get this working for you Just... okay bear with me just one sec here and i'll get this up for you Okay, so here's the intro. So I'll just 
I'll just play it for you one more time here. We're back. There we go. So that's the new introduction. All right, okay. Adam, I didn't know it could be used for car insurance purposes. Yes, okay, Liam, how do you, how do rental trucks work? Can just anyone drive a 53 foot rider truck? I saw a guy in a rental truck today on the Taconic Parkway who needed a state police escort backwards because of a low bridge. <laughs> Great story, Liam. Great story. Uh, most truck drivers know that in the United States, you are not supposed to be on a parkway with a big vehicle. Now, it is possible that what you're talking about, the person was moving furniture and had to get somewhere on the parkway. But for the most part, truck drivers and bus drivers know that they're not supposed to be on parkways for exactly that reason of low bridges and overpasses. Now, if you do rent a rider truck or a Penske truck or some other rental company that does rent these large vehicles, uh, you have to have the appropriate license, obviously, and most of the people who rent these larger trucks uh, for the purposes of uh, using them in commercial, um, you know, hauling freight and those types of things, most of the time, uh, it's going to be a trucking company that's going to rent these to augment their fleet. That's the reason they're doing that. Okay, there you go. Okay, hall phase, Liam, where'd he go? Liam, and there's a lot of signage too. He must have been really ignorant. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so Brock, excellent. You guys are getting connected there and that's really great. Thanks for helping each other out. I, that's just awesome. Uh, if you get a flat tire in the second lane at night, what should you do? Uh, hall phase, just get yourself off the road. Even if it's flat, just drive on that, that flat tire. Uh, in a four-way intersection blessed are when you're talking about four-way intersection blessed are you talking about a four-way stop is that what you're talking about it <laughs> zero zero thanks it sounds like you're teaching race car driving no we're just getting we're just all revved up there <laughs> thanks sad Ann. that's really great okay Tommy I like the intro Awesome. I'm yeah. I'm, I I like the intro too. I'm it, it. I think it works well, and it's short, so it uh, you know it just reminds people. Yep. Thanks so much, Easton. Uh, I really like it, so it's good. Yes, Easton. I'm planning trucking routes. Corey will get that video for you. Uh, route navigation, route planning. That's the video. It's it's been a long time since I've done that video, so. Yes, that video is there, Easton, uh, that you want. I'll start looking over here at the camera. My apologies, I've been looking over there for the longest time. Uh, so, okay. Um, sorry, I had a brain cramp there. Yes, route planning and navigation. There's a video there, and as well, there's a logbook exercise, and a lot of what I do in the logbook course for the United States is I go through uh, how to plan your route with your rules and regulations in place and that way you can avoid congestion in the larger cities because one of the one of the routes that I do is I go into Los Angeles and uh, start in Arizona so that gives you some idea how to do all of that sort of thing. Excellent. Everybody likes the introduction. Really glad. Okay. Lessons on how to strengthen cargo. So I think what you're talking about, Sad Ann, is uh, how to tie down cargo. I don't have a specific video on that, but that is one of the videos in the workings for sure on how to secure cargo on a flat deck and on the back of a vehicle and those types of things. Uh, okay, haul phase. Are trucks allowed to drive on any roadway? If not, which roadways are not allowed to drive on? Okay, so most of the time, uh, residential areas are going to be uh, prohibited. You're not going to be able to drive trucks in residential areas unless you're there specifically to pick up or deliver. For example, uh, house furniture moving moving trucks. Uh, they can go into residential areas. Parkways in the United States. Most parkways uh, prohibit large commercial vehicles from going on them. Uh, and any other, tr any other uh, road with a sign on it. Most commercial vehicles are only allowed on major routes. 
and you learn that very quickly whether you're on a major route or not because there's lots of low bridges, overhead obstructions, trees, uh, wires, hydro wire, electrical wires, and you know other utilities and those types of things. So, the, so it's mostly major routes that trucks are, are allowed on and not parkways and res, residential streets. Adam, thanks for the insurance advice. I'll research that tonight. Also, any thoughts on driving a U-Haul truck for the purposes of moving houses? I've never driven anything larger than an SUV. Uh, yeah, Adam, for sure. You know, hire a U-Haul. Just know that you're going to have to take your corners wider and pay attention to uh, overhead obstructions. And there's a video here on overhead clearances and have a look at that, uh, Adam. Corey will get that up for you. And that will... You, inside of the u-haul in lots and lots of places they'll tell you exactly how high that vehicle is and pay attention to the uh, height signs when you're driving on the roadway especially when you're going over underpasses and bridges and know that for most vehicles in canada the maximum height is 4.15 meters and in the united states where you are it's going to be 13 feet 6 inches now adam if you're driving into new york state <laughs> new york state likes to be a little bit different in terms of its rules and regulations in in New York State, they did something different where they measure from the center of the hub to the top of the vehicle. And so most legal heights in New York State are going to be 12 feet 6 inches, which is going to be high enough. Now, if you're in the least bit doubt about being able to get under a fueling canopy or a bridge or an overpass, just stop. It doesn't even matter if you're backing up traffic and get out and have a look and make sure that vehicle is going to go under that, okay, before you drive under it. Uh, okay, so Blessed wanted the uh, video on four-way stop signs. Uh, Corey, if you could get that up for you, that'd be great. Easton, Hall Phase, what is the worst disaster you've seen with a semi-truck? Uh, uh, Hall Phase, I've seen a lot of them. And one of the worst ones, there's a couple of things that they haul. Uh, one of them is um, metal pipes or rebar on the back of a flat deck or uh, coils of steel or coils of paper, those types of cargo, what happens is if the semi truck slams on the brake or is involved in a front end collision, what happens is the load on the trailer lets go and oftentimes it will just crush the cab or it will shear the cab off and the driver is often killed in those types of crashes. And actually I'm working one in a post crash analysis right now where the driver was operating a flat deck, he rear ended another semi truck and what happened, he was hauling uh, four foot square sheets of copper sheeting and the load let go and it basically took the cab right off the truck and unfortunately the driver lost both legs above, just below the waist and it was just a really awful crash. Uh, okay, Easton, that will help me out a lot going into trucking right out of high school, making 70,000 a year plus 30,000 for being an equipment technician as well, yes. There's, there's a good living in truck driving. It, it's, I'm not going to, you know, it, it is a tough job. It's, it's hard work. It's, and, you know, if you're doing over the road stuff, it's going to be long haul work and it's really a lifestyle. So it is a tough career. All right. So just if you like the, the live stream, if you like what you see here on Smart Drive Test, give it a thumbs up. If you're new here, consider subscribing. More than happy to help you out. If you're watching on the replay, again, give it a thumbs up. And we really appreciate that. And it helps us out. <laughs> yes, no, that's exactly right, Sam. Don't peel off the truck like a sardine can because it does come off like a sardine can. Zay J, uh, doing a live today. I've been watching your videos for about two hours straight. <laughs> Zay J, definitely, definitely take a break. You know, walk around a little bit. But uh, that's really great to hear. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, Zay J, by all means, leave us a comment. Always happy to help out for you to be successful in whatever you're doing. Hall phase at night on freeways, motorbikes like to speed. Yes, the reason for that hall phase is because they can get away with it. Uh, there's very there's reduced numbers of police officers, and unfortunately, a lot of activity at night is going to be speeding, and there are going to be drunk drivers on highways and freeways. So know that as well, especially after the bars let out at two o'clock in the morning. If you are driving at night during those times, know that you could encounter drunk drivers. So make sure that you give lots of space between you and other drive, other vehicles on the roadway. And why is it that when going under a pass uh, passway, a truck gets stuck when it's below the height posted? Uh, the reason for that, Anne, is because the driver, the CDL driver behind the wheel of the truck is not paying attention to the height signs and doesn't know the height of his or her vehicle 
13 feet 6 inches in the states 4.15 meters in Canada if the sign doesn't say that height minimum do not go under it okay uh, when I let my aunt drive my conversation uh, van she worked at a hospital and tried to park in the garage and needless to say the big van <laughs> became a convertible <laughs> sorry to hear about that Easton yeah uh, when to start stepping on the brake I'm from California okay ZJ what I'm gonna say to you is uh, look uh, go back to the parking lot get some of those 36 inch one tall meter pylons and work with those in the parking lot and and get better control of the primary controls the steering wheel the brake and the throttle and Corey will get the video up here for you on learning how to drive and that will improve your overall driving it'll improve your braking it'll improve your acceleration it'll improve your control of the steering wheel so have a look at that video and do the exercises in that video and all of that will help you out you are most welcome sat Ann. my pleasure uh, yes there we go so corey has got up when the, when the live feed is we have a live feed every Sunday the only time that we don't have live feeds on Sunday is when we have holidays in the United States and in Canada and I'll try as much as I can to put those up and post that if there's a holiday then what we do is we move it till Monday and we have it on Monday instead okay uh, motorcycles uh, hall phased you're not gonna ban motorcycles even in Toronto <laughs> lots and lots of people like their motorcycles there we go okay ZJ that's really great yep so you're still learning and everything's going well you're gonna do great Easton yep it's it's good work all phase okay ZJ thank you so much welcome to smart drive test we really appreciate it and I think we're going to start winding up here for the night Lars, does a driving instructor need to practice park parallel parking on the left side? Uh, no, Lars, you don't have to practice parallel parking on the left side. It's really unlikely that they're going to uh, make you do that for the purposes of road test. It's only on the right side for those of us who drive on the right side of the road. For those of you on the other side of the road in the world, yes, obviously you're going to drive on that. And Mark Anderson, thank you so much for the contribution there. That's really great. It's Tremendously appreciated. Tremendously appreciated. It's always nice to see that coming in. So thank you again. And as I said, we're going to wrap up here for tonight. We've hit the hour mark. But if you're watching on the replay, by all means, give it a thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions at all about passing your road test, leave a comment down in the comment section. I do my best to get to them. It might be a couple of days, but I do try and get to all the questions and answer people's questions for them uh, and help you out. And my boyfriend drives a a tick car and I wanted to know can I practice using his car uh, in a TLC car what what is a TLC car and and thank you mark <laughs> even more there awesome Lars thank you so much uh, yeah what is a TLC car blessed you're most welcome Pretty sure that's illegal. Yeah, because I don't I don't know what that is. Barry Mouse thinks it's made me a better driver. Excellent. Thank you so much, Barry Mouse. It's really great that we could help you out. And yeah. Okay. So Anne, what I'm gonna get you to do is send me an email, Rick at Smart Drive Test. Tell me where you are in the world that you're practicing your road test and send me a little bit more description about what that car is, because if the car is illegal in any sense of the imagination. And what I'm saying in terms of illegal is, is that there is a vehicle manufacturer's legislation. And if it doesn't conform to that legislation, then you can't be practicing it, especially as a new driver. Okay. All right. Uh, actually, almost positive. Uh, taxi and limousine commission. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of all of you who have passed road tests in the last week, congratulations on passing your road test. Uh, if you're coming up to a road test, good luck on your road test. And I'll be around for a few minutes to answer any questions that people have on comments and whatnot. So have a great night. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your questions. And all the best. Bye now.